Up next, we've got Emily Boltz. Um, Emily is a food technologist, experienced designer, multimedia artist, and educator. She holds a Master's of Industrial Design from the Pratt Institute and is the founder of the Food Design Studio there. She has published two books and won Best First Cookbook in the World at the uh, Prix 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 Gourmand uh, in the Louvre in Paris. And uh, a little extra fact about her, she not so secretly wishes she was a fish or a pineapple. So uh, please give a warm FITC round of applause for Emily Boltz. Thank you. Thank you, bingo. Uh, who else wants to be a fish in here? One person, two, three people. Great, I, I don't feel alone. So uh, as said, my name is Emily Baltz, and I work in all sorts of different ways. Most recently, for the last 10 years, I have been using food in new and novel ways. So what I want to talk to you about today is how food can be used as a medium for creativity, invention, and kind of uh, maybe radical discomfort. <laughs> You'll see what that means soon. Now, the first thing I would like to ask all of you to do is if you're not sitting next to someone, could you please sit next to someone? Like if there's a seat between you, you should sit next to someone. You're already sitting next to each other. That was easy, right? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> there will be no harm, no physical harm will be induced, don't worry. Okay, you have, excellent, you've all found someone except for this lonely guy. Oh, now, oh, great. Now, what I would like you to do, so, which is better looking as a room, you got a hole right there, uh-huh. <laughs> One guy doesn't want to play the game. So, what I would love for you to all do is uh, close your eyes with me. And I would like you to think very deeply about yourself. So who are you? Where do you come from? What do you really love in this world? What do you really hate in this world? Maybe you hate this idea of having to sit next to someone else, <laughs> sorry. Um, and now channel all of that feeling and I want you to think about, if you were a fruit, what fruit would you be? Would you be like squishy and oozy, or would you be sort of crunchy and refreshing? No, no, not a banana. We know that bingo is a banana. Would you be streamlined? Would you have edges? Would you be furry? Would you be prickly? Would you be cold? Would you be warm? Think of all these qualities of what fruits can be and choose right now what fruit you are and open your eyes. Okay, everyone has chosen their fruitness, good. Now I would like you to turn to the person next to you, one person, and please lean into their ear one at a time and whisper what fruit you are. Okay, go. And then tell the other person what fruit you are. Very good. I can see. <laughs> so, uh, from the looks on your faces, I see some horror <laughs> and some delight. So, welcome to my presentation. Now you understand what you're getting into. So <laughs> well done. <laughs> So, uh, the idea of food and identity is something that's very near and dear to my heart. I grew up outside of Chicago in a town called Joliet, Illinois, which is 40 miles south of Chicago in the middle of America. And my mother is French and my father is American. And the interesting thing in our household was that my mother continued her French culinary traditions all throughout our childhood, which meant during the 70s and the 80s in America that we ate very differently than other people. We ate at 8 p.m. instead of 5 p.m. We had a lot of, lot of silverware. <laughs> we had lots of dishes. I would go to high school with a lunch that my mother would pack for me and I would set off the metal detector I went through every day because of this exact fork, right? Um, 
So food became a material that really started to create a sense of identity in our family and therefore in myself. It created a sense of belonging in our home, but it also created a sense of not belonging sometimes in the context of the culture that we grew up in. And so very quickly as I went back and forth between cultures, and I think probably many people in this audience have experienced similar things, in terms of asking yourself, who am I? What am I? Where do I belong? And what does belonging even mean? And one of the biggest differences and similarities that I found going through this experience was how people ate. What they did around food seemed to lay a very clear foundation for how they behaved in the rest of their life. So it became a material for me that was full of opportunity and potential as well as creativity. And that has informed my work to this day. Now, not just this sort of culinary tradition informed it, but also the landscape that I grew up in. So Joliet, Illinois, has anyone been there? Wow, yes, thank you. Okay, Joliet, Illinois kind of looks like this. <laughs> you drive along highways, there's lots of industrial production, and when I was very small, I would sit in the car with my father and drive down these highways and look at these vistas and say, what's that? And he would look at me and he would say, Emily, that is a cloud factory. Oh. <laughs> and what about this? <laughs> oh. In the, this is where ice cream comes from. <gasps> what the? So all of this was like filled with ice cream. I would have these dreams about climbing up onto these large containers, right, and diving into strawberry and chocolate and vanilla. The world around me very much became a catalyst and a medium for all sorts of invention. And I think that kind of creativity, when we start to put lenses, different lenses onto our everyday, we suddenly have radical new possibilities. And we can see that the world around us can also be a medium for great imagination and invention. Now, what better material they're in as I said before, than food, because food is obviously part of our culture, is part of the fabric of our beings, but it's also part of our everyday. I call it sort of like the circuit training of our senses. We do it once, twice, three, five, six times a day, depending on who we are and where we live. And the interesting thing about food as a material is that it is the only material in the world that we experience with all of our senses. When you eat, you're not just seeing, right? You're not just tasting, you're also smelling and hearing and touching. So it's this amazing amphitheater of experience that goes inside of you. So here is this incredible material just ripe with creativity, but it actually wasn't always this way. Now, rewinding hundreds of years ago, food in the context of creativity and in the context of art was not something that was deemed a medium. We could paint about food, we could sculpt about food, we could make food and serve it at a dinner, but it was never ever considered to be a medium for anything other than objective gaze, right? So it was a subject, not a medium. And what that also sneaks in is that in that time, art and creativity in general meant that it was not about our senses that creativity, therefore, would not exist in a full human experience. And we see that drastically different today, I think, with all the interactive technology that we're seeing, with all of the experiential design, we really start to see a shift. But where did that come from? So I'm gonna give you a short little history lesson. If you have heard of The Futurists, has anyone ever read The Futurist Cookbook, which is pictured here? No, maybe one or two people. Okay, one person, wonderful. So these are the originals. So art in this context, art in food, exists sort of in a two-dimensional, objective way, right? Until about the 1930s. And in 1932, a group of Italians, known as the Futurists, were celebrating modernity. They thought that all of the technological advances that happened in the last industrial revolution were contributing to the speed, the modernism, the lightness of the future of civilization. And specifically, this group of Futurists looked at their peers, Italian culture, and said, you are lazy, you are boring, you're not embracing modernity, and it's because you eat too much pasta. <laughs> so uh, whether or not that is true is left to the side. The fact is, is that the futurist created a cookbook, which is actually a manifesto designed to 
kind of mimic the idea of cooking recipes. And so in this cookbook, you find absolutely absurd, provocative recipes that for the first time within the context of art and creativity are using food as a critical medium. Food to provoke Italians in this context to get out of their everyday, to think about how they consume and how they feed themselves in radically new ways. One of my favorite examples is the tactile dinner party recipe. So this recipe requires that you arrive to the dinner and that you put full furry pajamas on. And then you sit down at the dining table and then you're served a tactile salad, which comes in a music box. And with one hand, you crank the music box and eat the salad with your face. And then when you come up, a waiter sprays perfume and cologne on you and back down you go while the other hand rubs the furry pajamas of your neighbor. So like, first of all, this is one of those like head padding stunt, like whoa, physical feet. And it also radically <laughs> provokes the way that we think of salad. <laughs> so this was all based on a premise that I actually think has a lot of truth to it. And the futurists believe that people think, dream, and act according to what they eat and drink. So once again, that there was all of this potential for designing human behavior, and maybe more so, redesigning human behavior by looking at our everyday actions through a provocative new lens. Now, what else this did is that it also served more than anything to provoke a different mindset. Essentially, at the core of the Futurist Cookbook is a radical idea that uses absurdity to say, hey, everyone, wake up. There might be another way. And to get to another way, sometimes we have to go through discomfort, absurdity, and maybe a little joy. So it's a piece of work that very much informs my own work, but I also think lays a groundwork for ways that we can think about our own creativity and what we might need. Because if people really eat, think, and dream according, or think, eat, and dream according to what they drink, what if we could eat our dreams <laughs> is often my question. How could we maybe inverse that statement? And uh, what I want to share with you today is some work that comes out of this question uh, in my own practice. So three things came to mind that were once again kind of these dreams that I thought about, because if we can eat our dreams, what does that then mean for our daily behavior? So I'll share with you three things that come from um, an inspiration of tickling cocktails, speaking spices, and singing ice cream. Now, the first one is this notion of a tickling cocktail. So what does that mean? Well, there was this phase in mixology, which is maybe a little bit less now, but a few years ago where everyone was spraying things on your cocktails. You know, you'd go to a fancy bar and it was like, would you like essence of pshh? Like, oh, yeah, I do, Shh. like, whoa. And I would watch these things because I love, oh, part of the reason that I love working in this, this like industry is that you go into a bar or restaurant, right? And you suddenly are in this theater of life. You're like, there's a table in front of you and this person, and you have this little moment all to yourselves and all of these things arrive that make you feel all sorts of different things, right? And then you get to act it out together, ooh, feeling all sorts of things, first dates, breakups, marriages, friendly conversations, right? Big revelations, I have to tell you this important secret. Wow, right? If you start to think about these settings in that sense, they become the stage for the daily dramas of our lives. And they're heightened by all these special effects. So one of the special effects here, psh, sort of added this like joy to my bar going experience. And I started to wonder what might it feel like to be that cocktail? Cause it looks like it's being tickled. <laughs> um, so I'm, I made this a, uh, well, I'll share it with you. Ready? Yep. Okay. You smell it all right now. Oh, it's not busy. <laughs> So that is uh, the world's first sprayable cocktail booth. <laughs> yeah. 
made in collaboration with Smooth Technology and Interactive Design Studio in Brooklyn. And uh, the idea of it was this, right? How could we maybe take this really wild abstract idea and create a sensory experience? How could I be tickled by a cocktail? So this, as you can see, is very analog. It's a bicycle pump, and it's connected to a paint gun canister and there's liquid inside of the paint gun. And when you press it, psh, the force shoots it up into your face. So just like if you were pumping your bike, here you are pumping a cocktail. Uh, this was also flavored with mint, which I don't really recommend moving forward if you do wear the safety goggles, because it's pretty potent. Now, these kinds of experiments, I call them, really challenge me to feel the everyday in a radically new way. It's what I'm most interested in in life. Like, this is a precious thing we get to experience just to be here in this room and to do what we all do. So how can we live that to the fullest? Um, kind of the critical side of that, when I was also making this bumping cocktail booth, was I was also reading this book, so Huxley's Brave New World, which actually was written about at the same time as a futurist cookbook. You know, I think these time periods are also really interesting because the last industrial revolution has a lot of similarities to the digital revolution that we're going through right now. Lots and lots of change, lots and lots of advancement. Um, and what is our responsibility or response therein as artists and creatives? Huxley wrote a rather dystopian view of it, but through the lens of a fake utopia. He looked at basically America and said, oh, Every other culture, maybe we'll think of critically, but America, you people, your indulgence and pleasure is what will control you. And so A Brave New World, if you haven't read it, is a view of a world where people actually stop feeling by taking a special drug, and the only way that they feel is through machines. And Huxley invents these kind of crazy machines that make you feel stuff, right? Mm -hmm. One of the machines therein is a scent organ. And this scent organ was made for people to come in and, and smell arpeggios of thyme and lavender and rosemary and pig dung, right? So here you could have this olfactory experience that would make you smell things. Now, I was reading this and thinking, my God, we're in the same moment in time, right? Is this what's happening to us? Are we losing our feeling? Uh, I was also in parallel, asked to participate in a music festival called the Panorama Music Festival in New York City, where artists were being invited to develop interactive musical instruments. And as all of this is going through my brain, I suddenly thought, aha, what if I was to remake Huxley's smell organ? What if we could smell our music, right? What if we could feel it in a new way? But how could we do that as maybe an evolution as a commentary on not where we were told we were going to be, but maybe where we want to be. So instead of just making a smell organ, I made what I call the feeling machine. And so I diagrammed this organ as a 10-sided structure that has 10 different stations, and each station is a different basic human emotion, from happiness all the way to disgust. And I worked with a perfumer, uh, sound engineers, and then also fabricators to design what became known as the dream machine, the, I think, the world's first smelling, feeling machine. Uh, and it premiered at the Panorama Music Festival. Now, what you can see here is it's actually the beginning of the idea, the tickling cocktail, appears here as well. Because each station is operated by a bicycle pump. Um, it also shoots, obviously, it's going to shoot smell at you. That's the point, right? But these horns are made of a collage of a French horn and a trombone stuck together to make this sort of absurd Dr. Seussian shape. And so as you pump the bicycle pumps, you actually are moving air over a pressure sensor that is inside of a paint gun can. Inside of those paint gun cans are custom air fresheners that were designed with Givaudan, a French fragrance house, that were to represent each of the different human emotions. So air is going through here, and just like we saw in the analog version of the cocktail pump, you start to get an analog smell experience. It's powered by your body. Psh, you're moving air through it and smelling whatever that emotion is. But the other thing that's happening is that as pressure is going over the sensor in the paint gun can, it's capturing that data and sending it back to a Max MSP that is talking to Ableton Live. 
and shooting out MIDI that is connected to a series of talk boxes. And if anyone has ever played a talk box, please come find me afterwards. Talk boxes are these sort of two analog tubes that go into your mouth and make your body into an amplifier. Peter Frampton made them famous. Um, and what we found was that by connecting the talk boxes to the horns, we had natural amplifiers, because we play horns with our mouth and the talk boxes work with mouths. So suddenly we had invented this totally new way of dispensing sound and smell in the guise of feelings, because one of the most interesting things that came from this project was that I spoke with the perfumers once as like a project update and said, how are we doing? And the head perfumer came back to me and she said, oh, Emily, it's just wonderful. All the perfumers are busy working on their feelings. Ah, oh. <laughs> so the subplot is revealed, right? The actual experience of it is, uh, is this, and I will share with you a video that Ant Food made. So Ant Food was a music studio, which also has offices here. Um, I worked with Ant Food in Brooklyn, I work with them a lot, and they made this rather absurd video that I would like to share with you now. The Dream Machine is a multiplayer olfactory organ that combines smell, sound, touch, and vision in a single immersive experience. It's f***ing dope. Ant Food collaborated with the magnetic, Emily, lightning bars, smooth technology, number four studios, Dave and Gabe, and Javorden, to create the Dream Machine. We composed a piece titled The Smell of Science and created interactive audio reactions for each of the 10 unique emotions. Like respect. Bow down to those motherfucking brass stabs. What about anger? Vocalize that beast within. And disgust. Ant Food developed a custom workflow and audio engine to pass sounds from multiple interfaces through Peter Frampton style talk boxes attached to repurposed French horns. Check this shit out. The Dream Machine it was a big hit at the Panorama Music Festival, Brooklyn's new lab and beyond, grabbing attendees by the motherfucking neck and transporting them into the Dream Machine. There were a lot of beeps in that, right? <laughs> Ant Food is an incredible creative studio. And through those moments, something that I also find throughout all these projects is that naturally when you use food, if you are going to engage all the senses, that means you're actually working collaboratively all the time. And that in and of itself is probably a presentation to give one day. Um, but on the topic of sound, I was doing this in my home. Now, these are my spice and like dried goods canisters. And for a while I would label them with sounds instead of their names, just to provoke a kind of a different relationship to my ingredients in my kitchen. Uh, this is quinoa. I thought that the sound of quinoa was beep. Uh, with that in mind, I would look at my pantry and in this funny way be delighted every day when I would open it up and say, oh, what should, ah, ha, ha, woo, -hee. just new languages. Now, that sparked an idea that was actually a recent development, which was, what if your whole kitchen could do that? And so most recently, I collaborated with a Dutch art uh, artist, Klazine, and I'm going to massacre her last name because my Dutch is terrible, Van der Schlup, uh, who we worked Hi. on this. Talk to the futurist chef. Hi, future chef. <laughs> Greetings, human. This is Bot. I am a chef from the future. I'm so excited to meet you. You look super delicious. How do I look? You look very streamlined. You look very streamlined, yeah. Well, that's because I ate too many pixels for breakfast. They're really good for you, but only in moderation. So, this is an excerpt from something called Eat Tech Kitchen, which was just launched at IDFA's Doc Lab at the end of last year here in Amsterdam. 
And the idea here was to take, once again, this inspiration of the Futurist Cookbook and say, how could we use food and our technology to provoke new relationship to how we consume? And this idea of a talking kitchen was something that Klazine and I were really interested in. And so what we ended up doing was created a very rudimentary AI bot chef, which runs through Google Home. And the workflow goes kind of something like this. You open the bot conversation with a voice command. You then dialogue, including some kind of a decision tree. What do you like? Do you like this? Do you like that? What color would this be? And through that, the bot constructs a recipe, a totally absurd recipe. I'm going to pull a couple up for you so you get a sense of uh, what that might sound like. It prints it out using a tiny printer. And you can start to see here what the consequence <laughs> was of some of these. Now, on the right, you see these women uh, eating the internet off of their phone, the recipe that was printed out based on their responses was a series of ingredients was needed, your phone, a handful of WWW. Now, the set here is actually a pantry, and so there's all sorts of different ingredients that are labeled just like my spices in absurd new ways. So these black stringy things, which are licorice, are the uh, WWW, and your body. You also need three pinches of internet dust and two more humans with phone. And on this one, you grab a handful of WWW and place it on everyone's phone. And then you gather in a circle, and everyone holds their phones in front of them and closes and opens their eyes five times. Then you eat one part of the web using only your tongue, no hands. And then everyone holds their phone above their head and browses the dark web by scrolling their spine in a flowing movement. Meanwhile, you have to eat another part of the web with your tongue and one by one shout out a spell towards a platform that disobeyed your privacy. Uh, so everyone's shouting and standing in the middle of the circle while everyone else keeps scrolling their spine. Now, what this ended up doing was creating these totally absurd kind of dances in public space. Over here, you have this woman who is doing a geo unboxing recipe, which required her to build a small pastry and then scroll through her favorite online store while licking this small candy until she found something that she really didn't need. And once she found something she didn't need, she would then cut the thing in half and give it to her friend. Once again, right? What this really is doing is using the form of absurdity to totally provoke and create a new form of reflection onto how we communicate and consume our daily technology. So putting people in this sort of absurd landscape, making them do things, maybe the question there is, what will you do? If you are given a set of instructions, if you are told what to do, do you do them or don't you do them? And I think that's something with all of our technology, all of our designs, all of our behaviors and our responses is worth questioning. And why not do it perhaps with a little smile? On that topic, um, the last thing I want to share with you today, which you probably can guess what it is by now, is based on one of, I think, the more delightful things around the world, which is the topic of ice cream. Now. Uh, Ice cream, every culture has it? Yeah, every culture has it. And kind of everyone knows what to do with it, right? So this was the point of departure for the Lickestra, the Licking Ice Cream Orchestra that is created in collaboration with a really wonderful artist and technologist named Carla Diana, who now has just started the 4D design department at Cranbrook University in Michigan. Um, and along with Carla, we had a residency at the Visible Futures Lab in New York. And we wanted to come up with something that could combine our loves of technology and food. And what obviously we happened upon was that a band was a great way to express that. So we sketched some ideas, prototyped some cones, but also really thought about what does it mean to have a band? And I think the interesting thing about a band as a typology is that when you play in a band, you're forced to listen to each other if you want to be any good, right? And you're also forced to play together. And that maybe is the metaphor and the red line through all of this work is what does it mean to play together and why should we play together? So we came up with this idea that we would make a licking ice cream orchestra and these cones, which you also see here, are rapid prototyped. Inside there are capacitive sensors and when you lick the ice cream, you actually trigger music and it sounds something like this.
oh, that is the Licking Ice Cream Orchestra, the world's first Licking Ice Cream Orchestra. <laughs> I really like that to put, before, put that before everything, but it's true. So this version was created as a riff on gallery pedestal busts, right? It also served as a way to nicely trap people inside. And the only thing you can do when you're faced with an ice cream cone uh, is lick, right? So here's a little secret, I think, of physical interaction design. If you borrow from the everyday, you don't have to tell people what to do. They already know. That said, uh, what I do have today is a demo for you of the Licking Ice Cream Orchestra. So I'm wondering if there are four people who would like to come up and play the Licking Ice Cream Orchestra for all of your peers, and maybe not the internet, but probably. <laughs> <laughs> you, in the back. Two, three, four. Excellent. One, two, three, four. Okay, please come on stage. So uh, we also, right now, all of us have to give a large round of applause to these very brave people. Excellent. Okay, your name again. Margo. Margo. Hello. Hello. What's your name? I'm Gunnar. Gunnar. Margo. Jessica. Jessica. Yulda. Yulia. Yulia. Okay, so uh, you are, this, you know, this is the first performance of the Licking Ice Cream Orchestra in Amsterdam. So somehow you're gonna go down in history, uh, <laughs> one way or another. Now, there are a couple things to note, is that the Licking Ice Cream Orchestra functions in one way and one way only, and that is with your tongue. What we will soon discover is if you are conductive or not. So some of you might be robots, and we're gonna learn about that really quickly once you lick, right? So, hmm, prepare. The best way to lick is if you really put your tongue into it, like, eh, right? Just little taps, less positive. Uh, this also is, yeah, oh, I can also bring it down for you. Um, the, this also is not vegan. I hope no one is a vegan. Okay, good. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, vegans. I didn't make this an inclusive performance. Uh, okay. Now, we have sound. It's on. Okay, good. So we should start by testing your instruments. Is your microphone at a good height? Okay, could you lick, Yulia? We have real sound? It is ice cream. Oh. Woo! Well done. What a glorious tongue you have. Okay, N next, Jessica. Again. Oh, you got the beats. Again. Oh, oh, very good. Okay, Margo. You're a robot. Who are you? Again, again. That's you. Okay, next. Oh. Wow. Your tongue works. <laughs> okay, now what we will do is really perform this as a band. So you will really only have like five more seconds of this embarrassment, but I'm gonna give you a backing track, uh, a little bit of a beat. Okay, and then let's give you more. Okay, are you ready? One, two, three, lick. Take it home with you, yeah. And you don't want it. I don't want your ice cream, no, I don't. There you go. <laughs> you. You're welcome, I'll bring it to you. Well, uh, so 
I'm proud to announce that you don't have any robots among you. All those people's tongues work really well, as does their human experience. But maybe the point here, outside of you know, heroically embarrassing all of us, is that I really think that this is a way into invention, right? All of these different processes are embodied play. And when you use your body, you start to realize that your body is a hell of a lot smarter than your brain. Right? Things that we can get into, that we can play with, that we can do together, lead to all sorts of wild new creativity. And as I said before, I think food is such a powerful medium for that, because it has all of these senses within it, but also because it is a universal language between all of us, right? All of us eat everywhere in the world, most likely every single day, if we are that lucky. Um, but it also sneaks in maybe the subplot of what I want to leave you all with, is that it also is an invitation to feel fully alive. And for everyone in all of our moments, work, profession, relationships alone, that the goal of being here in this very precious little moment that we call life, I would invite us all to try to feel as alive as we possibly can in all of the moments, big and small. Thank you so much for having me.